And the reason I came out with the crash course and felt compelled to share it for free with everybody is because there's a story here that's not going to get told by the highest levels. This is one we're going to have to find out for ourselves, and it's really important we do that. Individuals need to start thinking about the ways in which their lives are going to change. This change is coming. And if you can get out in front of the changes, they can be better. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guest today is Chris Martinson. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Chris, when the oil prices in summer of 08 just hit their all-time high and then we had this economic meltdown a couple months later, I found myself thinking, there's gotta be some connection between those two. And about a half a year later, I watched your crash course, you know, the free download, the, the free DVDs for people. And it's like I said, you'll know, because you've been connecting the dots about energy and the economy and a lot more for a long while. So I want to hand it to you. Tell us what the crash course is and why you did it. Well, the crash course is, is the end of about three years of investigation. There was just something that, that appeared wrong about the economy to me all the way back in 2001 or two. You know what it was? I, I was watching my 401k statements and, and my broker statements just poop. And I got really tired of my broker saying, oh, it's a blip, you know, stocks for the long haul. And, and, and it started to ring hollow. And so I started to really dig into the economy, and I found some things there that, that really, frankly, were extremely surprising to me. Because here I am, I'm a guy, I've got an MBA, I've been in business for a long time, I have a science background as well, I've been through about as much education as you should have to go through, and somehow in all of that, nobody ever told me how the dollar comes into creation. It seems like a really central, germane Not piece bad of the if story, you got a right? PhD and you don't. Yes, I had they don't no tell idea. Us that. So once I started looking at that, I said, "Well, what else don't I know?" And all these things started to fall into place. And it was maybe a year after I started that that energy fell into my lap in the story of peak oil. And once I put those two pieces together, I said, "Wow, there's a really enormous story here." And of course, there's a thirty, which is the environment which is really, I'm not looking at global warming quite as much as I'm looking at something more immediate, which is the depletion of resources. Soils, fish, ore bodies, timber, you name it. There's all these things that are disappearing at a really fast rate. In fact, these things are disappearing at an exponential rate. There's this whole thread of this story that suddenly snapped into clear focus when I understood we haven't just been growing. We've been growing exponentially. Our economy, our use of energy, our, our use of resources, all of that. And it's just, that's where the story came from. That's the cornerstone that I remember, and your charts, which you know, go off the, the ceiling here, exponential. It's like, it's not easy to grasp. What is exponential? I think that's the heart of what your course is saying. Oh, it is. And, and they are hard to grasp because we, we're humans. We think linearly, at least I do. And so exponential growth is, is if you're looking at a chart, it would look like a hockey stick. Like it, it starts out slow and then boom, the chart shoots up into the air, right? And whether we're charting uh, the growth of lemmings you know, on the tundra or we're, we're looking at the growth of our money supply, we see these sort of hockey stick charts all over the place. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. We could live fine with that if we lived on an infinite world without any limitations. And the story became really fascinating to me because my main conclusion in the crash course is that we're alive at one of the most unique times of human history. We're alive at a time when an actual resource limit in the world will be hit. Suppose I had a magic eyedropper and I placed a single drop of water in the middle of your left hand. The magic part is that this drop of water is going to double in size every minute. At first, nothing seems to be happening, but by the end of a minute, that tiny drop is now the size of two tiny drops. After another minute, you now have a little pool of water that is slightly smaller in diameter than a dime sitting in your hand. After six minutes, you now have a blob of water that would just fill a thimble. Now, suppose we take our magic eyedropper to Fenway Park, and right at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, we place a magic drop way down there on the pitcher's mound. To make this really interesting, suppose that the park is watertight and that you are handcuffed to one of the very highest bleacher seats. My question to you is this. How long do you have to escape from the handcuffs? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? How long would that take? 
The answer is you have until 1249 on that same day to figure out how you're going to get out of those handcuffs. In less than 50 minutes, our modest little drop of water has managed to completely fill Fenway Park. Now let me ask you this. At what time of the day would Fenway Park still be 93% empty space? And how many of you would realize the severity of your predicament? Any guesses? The answer is 1244. If you are squirming in your bleacher seat, waiting for help to arrive, by the time the field is covered with less than five feet of water, you would now have less than five minutes left to get free. The one thing that I want you to take away from all of this, with exponential functions, the action really only heats up in the last few moments. Now, we've, we know that other civilizations have crashed when they've gone beyond the limits of sort of their local, what, their local resources. Mm -hmm. You're talking about global? This is global. There's no next horizon. There is no next continent. There are no yeah. vast new untapped resources that we don't know about. Um, there's an enormous story unfolding right now, watching how China's running around the world, acquiring resources, breaking out their magic checkbook uh, for everything from uh, the last known significant reserves of copper in Afghanistan, to which they overpaid by a billion compared to the next nearest competitor, wow. uh, to oil from Venezuela, to farmland in Africa, to uh, oil from Canada. So it seems to me that at least one nation out there gets it, which is that the next couple of decades are really going to be denominated and dominated by who has access to what. And China knows how important that stuff is. And they play, they're playing a different game, right? My clear sense of China is they're out of the starting blocks, they're running down uh, the, the trail, and the United States doesn't even know there's a, a, a race. We, uh, we haven't even started lacing up our shoes, I right? mean, we're back here still fighting the, the next level of the Cold War, all the little wars, you know, being the military. It's an old model. It's, it's the model we've run for a long time. And, mm -hmm. and this is the reason why I do the work I do. It's because that's, that's normal. It's very normal for cultures, for societies, for big corporations to, to continue doing what they've been doing, right? It's the reason why out of the original 30 Dow companies, only one is left alive. All the rest went out of business because when you stick to an old model, you stick to it until it runs out. And that's my concern. The reason I came out with a crash course and felt compelled to share it for free with everybody is because there's a story here that's not going to get told by the highest levels. This is one we're going to have to find out for ourselves, and it's really important we Because do that. they're invested still in living out the old story. Absolutely. It's, it's perfectly normal. In fact, we should expect that. And so the old story is go out, defend whatever we have to defend, and have a big military spread out, and have, tell me, tell me what's, what's the existing story, and then what story do we need to be finding? Well, the old story for the United States, and I think for a lot of the NATO countries in combination, is gunboat diplomacy. If you have a strong military and you can maintain a presence, you can control, control your access to the critical resources. So if you look at where the United States has its military arrayed in the Middle East, it's kind of all around the oil fields, and there's no, it's not an accident. Um, you know, that makes complete sense. But that makes sense in an old paradigm. And so people like me are starting to question, does it even make sense? Can you really secure access to something like oil, which, by the way, you have to put it in a big, slow ship that's now explosive because it's filled with a burnable substance, and sail at 12,000 miles. And uh, to me, that doesn't sound like a, a strategy I want to put all of my eggs into. You know, yeah. I'd like to maybe have some eggs in a couple other baskets that are out there. And this story now, you know, the crash course has been viewed, I think, about a million and a half times all over the world, getting translated into various languages because people are getting it everywhere, starting to wake up to the fact that there's something in our narrative, something in the story about how we're conducting ourselves at this critical turning moment of history that doesn't really add up. You know, the yeah. story just doesn't fit. Either they know it here or they know it here, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but they know it somewhere. I think that unease that we are feeling just in this year with the crash and the foreclosures and the unemployment, and it's like, and still the stock market is going up, and it's like, there's, there's some, it's like, I think people do feel that the ground has shifted, mm -hmm. and we don't even know if there's a ground under us. Right. It's absolutely true that... Um, I think that you know, my analysis of the current market situation, first of all, we've completely misdiagnosed this problem. Uh, the diagnosis is really simple. Uh, I can sum up our entire crisis that we just had in three words. Too much debt. That's all it was. It's what we had. Too much debt. Too much debt. So consider this. In 2000, the year 2000, at the beginning of the year, in January, we had $26 trillion of debt in America. So that's corporate debt, federal, state, local, personal, all levels of debt. And by 2008, that had gone to 52 trillion. Double. It had doubled. 
it had absolutely doubled. Now, uh, what do we know about debt? Well, you have to pay it back or you default on it. Those are your options. How do you pay stuff back? Well, you have a job, you have income. And so when we look at what happened to jobs and incomes over that same period of time, one was flat and the other went backwards. So while we were expanding our debt at exponential rates, the means to pay that back was stagnant or retreating. Wow. And so wow. that's the story. It wasn't any more complicated than that. You don't have to understand fancy economic rules, how the Federal Reserve can still claim to have missed this. It was too confusing. It's not. It's a very simple story. It's an old story. And we just went overboard with debt. So to attempt to try and recreate the experience we had while we were living with too much debt is, is worse than foolish. It's wasteful and it's going to be counterproductive. And it's kind of like taking two more steps up the step ladder you're about to fall off rather than taking two Except steps down. Step. And that's, but that's what we're doing. That's what as we're a doing. country is that's just more debt, more, you know, more money being printed and so on. And people know that. And, yeah. and that's why it doesn't feel right because we can look at that story and we can say, this doesn't make sense. If we took those same trillions of dollars we've been putting trying to keep the banks going, and instead we were putting in a smart grid and a high-speed electric rail system, and we were actually taking the natural gas that we've got and figuring out how to build pipelines and distribution centers and turning our cars into LPG-fueled vehicles, I would have such a completely different feeling about where we're at. But trying to get everybody back to borrowing more money so that we can be like we just were, so that the status quo can be maintained, is a broken story. How do we get out of this? We have to start telling ourselves a different story. First, we have to recognize what the problem was. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, some people use, I but think- But people a, are doing it instinctively. You know, the people that are getting, you know, see the, uh, are tightening their belts, mm -hmm. you know, at, at Main Street. The governments aren't too much. Well, this is the, this is the great story Most of our day. People are getting it. Yeah. People all over the place. I'm sure your listeners are getting it. The people who come to my site get it. People we don't know about everywhere are getting yeah. it. I can feel that movement starting it. And where people's minds go, eventually politics will follow. Mm -hmm. But for now, there's this very large and growing gap between people and politics. And this is starting to come out in various ways. And, uh, and, it, and it creates a, a sense of dis-ease in people yeah. to know that we want to go this way, but we seem to be going that way. So when I hear things, people express the statement and say, our country's off track. That means something very profound to me. And I, I fear that when people in DC read that, they think we need a different policy tweak, or maybe we'll get angry at the bankers for a week and that'll go away. Or, or they're just fundamentally, they are out of touch with the reality that more people have come to the conclusion is that we have to fundamentally change how, not just our relationship to debt, but our relationship to the world, our relationship to nature, our relationship to each other, that if we go down this path of status quo, we'll end up in a future that defaults into disaster, not one that we would shape by design. I see, you know, Wiley e. Coyote, you know, yes. dancing over the edge of the cliff and doesn't realize that he's only on air. I mean, that sort of feels to me like I what feel we're, that, we're doing. I, yeah. You know, so, so if, you know, so if it's coming from the ground up, from folks who get it, how would you articulate that story in a way that we could grab hold of that and talk to our neighbors about that, the other story? I, so I think it's, it's as simple as this. In the long run, if I imagine, you know, here we are, it's 50 years out. What does the world look like? Yeah. Uh, I fundamentally think that we've created a world that's worth inheriting. And what's a world worth inheriting? To me, it has intact ecosystems and it's got fresh water. It has lots of opportunity. We have meaningful jobs. It, it, we have real connections with ourselves and also with nature, with the world around us. It's a world where humans have figured out, again, we've, we've relearned something important, that we're a part of the world. Yeah, yeah. We're not separate yeah. from it. And we're fundamentally living within the carrying capacity of wherever it is we live. That we don't have a million more people on any part of the landscape than that landscape can support. So 50 years out, there's probably going to be fewer people, or at least a very stabilized population on its way down. Since there'll, we're be a, there'll be a yeah. population that's in, in relationship to the, to the world around it. Okay. Now, okay. okay, that's the future. How do we get there? The immediate steps seem pretty obvious to me. A, a simple thing that I think um, we could do at the national level, let's get a commission to understand and support and study where, what is net energy for any of the things we might want to invest in. So net energy meaning if we're going to take a barrel of oil to find natural gas or we're going to make a hydro dam or we're going to do something, how much do we get back? Because mm -hmm. it's not how much energy we have we care about, it's how much extra energy we get back after we've explored and, and found it. Yeah. This is one of the most important concepts. And if we had that, if we had that information, we'd be able to know, well, should we build a, a new ethanol plant or should we uh, insulate existing structures? 
We can't answer that because we don't actually, we can tell you how much it costs, but we have no idea what the benefit would be to us, uh -huh. what the return would be off of that. Individuals need to start thinking about the ways in which their lives are going to change. This change is coming. And if you can get out in front of the changes, they can be better. Well, Here's an example. Go ahead. In, uh, before I found all this information out, uh, here I am, I'm a guy, I'm 42 years old, I have three young children, I'm living in a five bathroom house on the coast of Connecticut, and I've got a boat in a slip with two engines on it. And I love that boat. Uh, after this story, uh, now, I live in a house less than half the size with one and a half bathrooms, and I've got a kayak with a paddle, right? You downsized considerably. Right, so by American standards, my standard of living fell off a cliff. Yeah but my quality of life went up a cliff. How, 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 what did it, I mean, in what way is it, the quality better? Because I started changing the stories that I was telling myself, whereas what was important to me before was my job and earning money and lots of symbols of status, and I'd sort of bought into the whole story of consuming, that, that, that was a, the acquisition of things was, was a way to get some sort of a good feeling around things. I changed my story. My story now is I said, the thing that's gonna be most valuable to me going forward are the people I know. It's gonna be my community. So mm -hmm. I changed what I value, so it changed what I do, who I know, what I say, what I do. And in this reconnection with community, I found much more joy and satisfaction and a sense of purpose in my life. And it has nothing to do with stuff. It has everything to do with, with what I consider to be more important now. And that's just how I approached it. And, and this has been a story that my family and I have both all pursued. And, it, and it's made a lot of sense for us. I would expect that other people choosing to live more simply, like we've had, had shows on, if we're going to get out ahead of the, the curve, because it could look like there could be a lot. I mean, if, we're, if America is going to continue to live by the old story, there's going to be a lot of suffering. There already is. Well, the old story is already breaking down. And we see the holes. Mm -hmm. And so part of the story, when you talk about looking at our energy use, I imagine that part of it is individually also the same thing, mm -hmm. reducing looking at how do I cut back on my energy use? Because mm -hmm. it's going to be more expensive. It will be more expensive. There is another energy crisis in front of us, whether it's in two years or it's in 10 years, doesn't matter. It's coming. Uh, we know that for a fact. So uh, in my own life, you know, here's how I translate that into my life. Um, I, I'm sitting here looking at, at, at uh, the money I do have, and I'm thinking, I don't know where to put this. I honestly can't find anything compelling. But as soon as I put it through this filter of thinking and understanding we are going to have an energy crisis, well, now it made perfect sense. Then I know where the next $20,000 I'm going to spend is going. It's going into solar hot water panels on my house. It's going into putting a little solarium off the side. It's going into a variety of energy infrastructure improvements on my house. And I guarantee you it's going to be the best possible return I can get off that money out of anything I could do with it right now in terms of, of an investment. Makes sense because your utility prices are going to go up, 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 right? They will right? if we don't even face actual shortages at some point in time. I mean, and so, so for people who own houses, what you've, all, you've described here makes sense. Mm -hmm. And people who don't, if they own a car, probably a smaller one or biking or other things that whatever it is, uses less energy or creates its own energy. Mm -hmm. Or even in your case, you know, maybe you can send it back to the grid and other people can take use of it and thus you get some more money. Fine. Still, there are people, um, let's say you've got somebody retired and they've got money in an IRA. What do they do with that if they cannot yet pull it out to go put a, the panels on their house? That's one of the most house? difficult questions that, that there is to ask right now. Because in many ways, the money's kind of trapped and there, there are tax implications to touching it. But on the other hand, you know, so that might inhibit us. Say, oh, I don't really want to touch that. That's, that's hard. But at the same time, we can look at what the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of printing money right now and say, there's a serious risk that that, all my assets could get eaten up through the process of inflation. And so I understand it's a really challenging dilemma and anybody who's in that situation needs to find a financial advisor who gets it. Like if you go to a financial advisor and say, what do you think about peak oil? And they look at you like a dog listening to white yes, noise. Yes, yes. You've yes. got the wrong one. Uh, you need to talk to somebody who can tell you about monetary policy. And they exist. They're out there and there's growing numbers of them. That's good to know. Absolutely. They should, uh, I'm, I'm, luckily I found one that's perfect and I've got my mom with this guy and he can talk about anything. I'll and talk it's to you wonderful. after the show. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a sense of a horizon that what else is going to be changing over the next 20, 30, or what we need to do in the next 20, 30 years. Well, you know what? It's kind of, it's uh, hidden in this story when I said we're changing our narrative. So much is implied by that. And I think this is a really exciting time to be alive. Yes. And um, uh, I'm glad I'm the age I am, but if I was in my 20s, I'd still be very excited. I'd be a little depressed if I thought I needed the future to look just like the past, because it's not going to. 
But we've got this new future. We're alive at a time when a course correction in all of human, we're gonna change the direction of humanity. And this is, this is just a, a fundamental time where you can have an enormous impact on the way things go and where we go. But where we might have um, had a lot of jobs that were, that were involved in the complexity of society, right? You know, we have special uh, communications directors for subregion, all these things that we do in service-oriented jobs. Our jobs are gonna become a lot more tangible. And so you mentioned one, it's gonna be farming in the new future is not gonna be farming like in the old past. Farming in the future is a lot more sophisticated. It takes going to take an incredible amount of knowledge. You're going to have to understand things like nutrient cycling in, in a depth that, that farmers today probably are mostly unaware. You're going to have to understand principles of permaculture. You're going to have to be a soil expert because we're going to have to figure out how to get the same amount of yields not using the easy club of, of fossil fuel inputs. Right. And so this is going to require the talent, the passion, the motivation of our best and our brightest. And we can, we can talk about jobs that exist like that all across the spectrum of, the, of our needs, our most basic needs in energy, food, water, sanitation, things like that. We're gonna have to be more clever, more focused, more careful stewards. We're gonna have to be more sophisticated. And I think that there's a lot of incredibly purposeful jobs in that sphere of things we just talked about. Which are just, we're just, the edges, the forward edges are just starting right now. I mean, I think of Paul Stamets and his research with, with mushrooms, yes, yeah. for example, to do, to cleaning out toxins and all, all kinds of other things we don't even know about. Um, it's one of those little A perfect seeds. example. I, I love what he's doing. Oh, yeah, right. We have about five minutes left, and I, I'm sure you have 20 minutes more. What haven't we covered? Well. You know, the thing that I'm working towards most right now, uh, I think, first of all, we have to raise awareness around these issues. But we have to go beyond awareness into understanding. Uh, mm. Awareness is just becoming, you know, aware that, like, maybe inflation is coming. But to really understand what that would mean to you, you have to do a little more study. How has it looked in the past? And what has it meant to other countries? And what shapes could it take? And all of these things before you move to solutions or, uh, or responses. Uh, it's kind of okay. like if I'm driving a car and I see my red engine light comes up, I am now aware that I have an engine problem, but I don't understand how my engine works. So anything I do to my engine is probably going to be an accident, right? <laughs> <laughs> so right, we, have this, right. we have this one path where we have to really raise awareness around the issues and build understanding at all levels, individually, at, with uh, local councils, with the federal government, with corporations, everywhere. And at the same time, we need to start articulating that vision of the future, which is if you don't know where you're going, it's very hard to get there. That's for sure. So we have to start painting that picture. What, what does that look like? And you know, one way or the other, we'll end up in a future. I just would really like it if we could pick the one we're going to inhabit. And then we have to work back from there and think about all the things we have okay. to do to get there. Okay. And there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of work, but it can be challenging, exciting. It's going to be um, maybe difficult. It could be disruptive. But if we do it right, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I truly think we have all the resources all the time mm -hmm. that we need right now to get it done. And we don't need any magic new technologies? No, they'll be nice when they come, but we don't need them. When you talk about that kind of knowledge, uh, th that understanding, I want to say that your crash course, which is a step, a big step in that direction, is probably an one of the most astoundingly clear things that I've heard that takes very mm, esoteric stuff that most of, I mean, I didn't study economy, um, helps me understand how we see it in our everyday life and how it's, how it's going to come down the road and affecting us. So I really want to say thank you. You've done a, a brilliant job of, for lay people to thank understand you. these factors that are getting woven together. So first thing that I'd say to people is, is, you know, watch this and watch it a couple times and three times. I think the other, as we go towards understanding, I mean, thinking about things like inflation, meaning the value of our purchases, our purchasing power will go down, mm -hmm. right? And so it won't help if you've got a million in the bank if, you know, a dollar is only worth, you know, half a cent. Um, where else can people turn um, for information? Obviously, you're keeping a blog going that, 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 that helps people kind of keep up with where mm -hmm. we're doing. Do you have other sources that you point people to for, to try and get that understanding of uh, that yeah. discussion? Yeah, there's all kinds of sources out on, on the Internet now that you can access very easily. There's uh, just a tremendous number of great books that are written. I've got a collection of these resources on my site. Okay. I'm also a fellow great. at the Post Carbon Institute. They've got some wonderful resources there. The Transition Movement has got some wonderful resources. In fact, it's amazing how many wonderful resources are existing out there. And those are all fine, but my strongest piece of recommendation is to don't do it alone. 
and to find other people that you can be in community with as you move through this information. Because I do, I, I give, the crash course is about getting the intellectual understanding, but there's an emotional dimension to that. Right? Yeah. So if the yeah. crash course is the left brain, let's take care of the right brain in another way. And it's going to point to, yes, some financial uh, implications that you can take a lot of steps around. Mm -hmm. There's some physical uh, preparations that occur to people. And then there's the emotional ones, which a lot of times I think get overlooked. I think and they they're do the most in this important culture. Ones. I mean, because in, this, in our culture, we so emphasize the, the, the intellectual, the ideas, and so on. It's like saying, but I'm scared about what might happen, or I'm, you know, how, mm -hmm. I'm feeling really vulnerable. My, I may lose my job, which means I lose my house, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I think I'm finding that uh, especially strong for me now to have other people who get what's going on may not understand all of it, but at least we see, you know, current yeah. symptoms and can say, it's okay to be scared, mm -hmm. it's okay to be feel lost and mm -hmm. you don't know what to do and, I mean, and hold each other's hands through that. And, it's amazing how and important that is. It really is. When, when I hold seminars and we get 50, 80, 100 people in a room to talk about the implications of the crash course, honestly, I could actually say nothing for the whole weekend and they would get so much out of it because... These look like usually like 50 people you just swept out of the mall or off the street and you put them in a room. They're just regular people now. They're farmers, ranchers, business people, housewives, single mothers, you name it. And you put them in a room and they just get to see that they're not crazy or alone yeah. Yeah. and that they're actually normal. And, and that alone has an enormous benefit. So when I say people should find other, other individuals or community to share this with, there's a really powerful and even tangible benefit to go along with, with the intangible side. It's really critical. So don't be alone with it. That's, that's my strongest piece Boy, of advice. Boy, that's a great piece of advice. Don't be alone with it. Yes, don't be alone with it. Well, thank you, Chris. I mean, you've just broken through a bunch of barriers for a lot of us, both on the intellectual level and your willingness to just spread this message, you know, free on the net, which is incredibly generous. But I see, I, you know, I expect that the returns will be right there for you. It's because, because you don't want to walk that path alone. No. We want buddies, you Absolutely. know, which is part of why I want you on Peak Moment, you know, to say <laughs> we aren't alone on this one. Thank you. Thank you very much for what you are contributing and for sharing that with us. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment, locally reliant living for challenging times, and here we are. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guest is Chris Martinson. If you value this program, come visit us at our website and see how you can contribute, peakmoment.tv. Join us next time.